Paris and a warm welcome to everyone joining us here. I'm Marie Dundas. I'm the environment editor at the international news channel France 24 based here in Paris. And I'm delighted to be here at the invitation of the Food and Agriculture Organization, part of the United Nations, of course, and otherwise known as FAO. Now, today we're here to talk about oceans and climate change. And I have a wonderful panel of guests lined up to talk us through and guide us through the discussion. But before we meet them all, I'd like us to just reflect on a few facts relating to the oceans. Now, the ocean is the most essential building block for life. Without it, there would be no us, no animals, no plants. Spurred by man-made climate change, however, the ocean's waters are rising, acidifying, ice is melting, coasts are flooding, species are dying, and communities are faltering. The latest research, in fact, shows that oceans have now hit their highest recorded temperatures, a record that keeps getting broken every year. And yet they're an incredible ally in the fight against climate change. They've absorbed almost all of the globe's excess heat, 93% of it. Now, keeping all that in mind, I'd like to now introduce our guests. Joining us from Rome, we've got Manuel Baranger, Director of Fisheries from FAO. From London, Fiona Harvey, award-winning journalist from The Guardian newspaper and someone whose articles I regularly turn to in my own work. We also have Celine Cousteau, environmental activist and documentary filmmaker, joining us here in France in the VAR. Also, Celine is the granddaughter of the great explorer and conservationist Jacques-Yves Cousteau. Many thanks for being with us. Joining us also from another continent, from Tanzania, we have Dr. Flower M. Suya, a world-class seaweed farming and innovation expert, and Mark Murphy, also joining us from New York. Mark is an executive chef and television food personality, regularly appearing as a judge on the hit series Chopped. Many thanks to all of you for joining us. Now, it's sometimes said that oceans don't get the respect they deserve. Now, just to make sure all our guests are alert and ready, can I just get a quick show of hands, whether you agree with the, the statement that oceans are too often a neglected priority when it comes to climate change? Can I get a, a show of hands? Celine, straight off the bat. First, I'd like to get a quick sense from each of you where you think we are at this present moment in relation to oceans and climate change. And I wanted to start with Manuel. How would you describe the state of the oceans right now and why should we care about that? I think that, um, I mean, addressing the question that you put earlier on, and I think that the ocean has been neglected in climate change discussions for a very long time because it's been taken for granted. Most of the, of the oceans in terms of climate change, the absorption of heat, the absorption of carbon is driven by physical and chemical processes. If there was no life in the ocean, they would happen the same. So for a long time, it just is regarded as something that happens. Um, while now it's starting to change because the realization is that the changes due to climate change are affecting the oceans in a multitude of ways. It's not just about warming. It's not just about acidification. It's not just about deoxygenation. It's about the biota that's in it. It's about the relationship between humans and the environment and that relationship is changing very profoundly and it needs to be more attention needs to be put into it now these are important as you mentioned because of the climate regulation role but let's not forget that 10% uh, of the world's population depend on oceans and the fisheries that come from oceans for the livelihoods most of the, those are at the bottom side of society at the bottom of society the poorest uh, and very often operating in very small uh, businesses that completely depend on healthy oceans and the dynamic oceans. And that's why we need to pay a lot of attention to it. I mean, it's often said that if oceans were a country, it would be the seventh biggest economy. And Fiona, the ocean, your opinion, where are we right now? And is it where we need to be? For a long time, we didn't realize quite how vital a role the oceans are playing uh, in climate change. We knew uh, that they were absorbing carbon dioxide, um, as, as you mentioned, um, but we didn't really know the extent to which the oceans were really acting as a buffer uh, between us and the worst impacts of climate change. Um, and the oceans are really coming to the point uh, where they can't absorb any more heat um, or any more uh, carbon dioxide. Um, we're really uh, seeing, um, there's been some, some great new research has shown um, that we've got heat waves over the ocean. When we think of heat waves as something happening over land uh, where they can be 
uh, devastating to people and crops and so on, but they're actually happening all the time over the ocean uh, around the world. And that is also um, having a terrible effect on the climate. It's just, it's a little bit harder to track. And that's why we've been less aware of it until now. Celine, what do you make of the comments that Manuel and Fiona have just said? And what do you think your grandfather who died in 1997 would make of the threats that oceans face today? Of course, as a child, you spent much time on his iconic boat Calypso. Well, I was, I was just reflecting back to something Manuel said, um, just in terms of the, the climate change oceans. Um, and it seems like nothing is wrong. I think one of the challenges is that we find ourselves amongst uh, communities and scientists who understand the role of the oceans in climate and who understand the changes because we witnessed it or we're studying it. But for the everyday citizen, for the everyday person, it's still a shiny surface and it's still a place to holiday and you still order seafood at the restaurant. And so the connection isn't being made with something deeper, which is the entire system collapsing because it's under the water surface. So I think there's a disconnect with the, the um, majority of the population because there's a lack of education and lack of understanding. Um, and because it's not a place that, that most people exist in, they exist perhaps near it or upon it. Um, going back to your question about my grandfather, I think that he would be saddened to see uh, the state of the oceans today and, um, and sad to see that he was predicting what is happening now, which is, which is really um, a total degradation of the oceans us treating it like a garbage can. Um, and I think we just, we need to pay more attention to that, but that's also our responsibility to bring it to the everyday person. I should mention here that the images you're watching are not of Jacques Cousteau, rather the images from the Cousteau biopic Odyssey directed by Jerome Sal and starring Lambert Wilson. Lambert Wilson has been a good friend to FAO in recent years. Now, Celine, you just mentioned that many of us are not living up close and personal with the ocean, but someone that is, is flower. Flower, can you tell us the impact of climate change on fisheries and seaweed farming? What have you been seeing? Yeah, climate change actually is affecting seaweed farming a lot because uh, we have well, 22 types of seaweeds that are farmed here. One is of higher value compared with the other, but because of uh, uh, warming sea waters, the temperatures are increasing every time. For example, now we have temperatures that go all the way to 38 degrees Celsius, which is quite hot. Uh, when actually our seaweed would, would prefer 25 to 31, 33 um, degrees Celsius, not more than that. So you see, for example, in, uh, in the, the villages that are farming seaweed, for example, 50 villages in, here in Zanzibar and Unguja, only uh, two or three villages are farming uh, the higher valued seaweed. The rest cannot because of uh, because the higher valued seaweed does not grow anymore. So farmers are actually are even economic, and the, the resilience of the farmers is affected as well because because they are producing the lower valued seaweed. So species that are no longer being cultivated. So, you know, changing, forcing people to change what they grow. Mark, you're at the other end of the spectrum. In fact, how is the state of the oceans impacting you? Are some of the problems that we're hearing about filtering and making their way down to restaurants and chefs in New York? Well, you know, for us as, as chefs, I feel like we're sort of, um, we're, we're the connection between what you all are doing and talking about the ocean and the, and the temperatures rising. But we as chefs should be influencing our, our, you know, the world on how we eat. And uh, a good example of that is, I mean, we're talking about kelp, we're talking about seaweed. I, I had no idea about it until uh, somebody came to me uh, and gave me a book, actually, a, a guy by the name of uh, Brent Smith. Uh, and he, he wrote this book about kelp and all everything kelp. And he's, he was a fisherman and he realized it was hard and a hard time uh, making a living as a fisherman anymore uh, and realized that kelp was really, you know, reinvigorating the ocean and, and bivalves were growing near kelp. So it was great. So what does it say to a chef? It's like, we'll figure out how to cook with kelp. I mean, let's get people eating kelp. So um, I immediately, I, I got in touch with a friend of mine, Vivian Sorensen, who, who is, who's a, uh, was a person who makes uh, documentaries and things like that. And she was already doing things with kelp. Uh, so what I did was I sat and I called a friend of mine at the New York Times and we got a bunch of kelp from some kelp farmers. And we sat in a kitchen for nine hours and we started cooking recipes with kelp. I was making instead of, um, you know, in, in Italy, you have a beans and es escarole dish, right? Well, we were doing beans and kelp. Well, if we can make kelp taste good 
and not only is it nutritious, it's healthy, it's a great fertilizer as well. It's just, it, it, it seems to be the, um, I mean, kelp should be the new, the new arugula, the new kale. Everybody should be eating kelp. And as, as a chef, we should be responsible in trying to introduce those types of, of uh, ingredients. It's the same thing when everybody, which is still going on, when there's overfishing going on. Well, chefs were responsible not to be using big eye tuna or, um, you know, cod was being fished too much in the Northeast of America. Stop putting cod on the menu. It's very simple. We, we, we can influence uh, the, the world in, in very interesting ways. And, and we do hear from our farmers. We hear about climate change. We hear about problems. You know, the guy who's getting my lobsters uh, is saying, wait, I have to, my lobsters aren't as plentiful this year. I have to go farther north. The water is too warm. That's a problem. Now, and that's a problem for me because now my lobsters have to come farther. They have to be trucked down from farther north. So we understand that, but we do it through the, through the stomach and through the menu development. Just, just a, a, in a couple of words, how would you describe what kelp tastes like? You know, kelp for me was one of those things you, you think it's going to be really salty, but it's not. It comes out of the ocean. From what I understand, they blanch it. And with the, the, the producer I was getting it from was blanching it and cutting it into like fettuccine. So, uh, it, it, and you could impart flavor into it. I, I co feed it with garlic, you know, like you would duck legs. Uh, it was great flavoring. I, I used it in, um, I cooked it on the bottom of uh, roasting a chicken with uh, carrots and onions and celery and the kelp got, got moist, it absorbed flavor, it got crispy. It was, de it was delicious. It was, a, uh, it, was, it was a great, it was a fun ingredient to play with and it was a very successful, let's put it that way. Great, excellent. Now, in fact, what I wanted to do was touch on some of the problems in the first half and then move to solutions. Mark, you've already jumped ahead and, and touched on some of the solutions, but we will come back there. But first, I wanted to just focus a little more on the actual problems we've got right now. And Fiona, the ocean has already for many years been facing the impacts of climate change. And then in 2020, COVID-19 happened. In what way do you think this global health pandemic has perhaps affected our oceans and fisheries? Well, the immediate effect of the pandemic was that uh, an awful lot of things were shut down uh, in a lot of countries. Um, and that had an impact on things like greenhouse gas emissions. So we started putting a lot less carbon dioxide into the air all of a sudden. Uh, carbon dioxide emissions fell by um, as much as a third uh, in some places in the immediate aftermath of those early lockdowns. Um, but of course the emissions rebounded, unfortunately, rather quickly. Um, some rebound was inevitable, but actually we could have done more uh, to stop uh, emissions from rebounding as, as fast and as far as they did. Um, but, you know, what we've seen from that is that emissions, uh, the, the dip in emissions was only temporary and it won't have a long lasting effect. So the effects of that on the oceans will be quite small over time. The other effect, however, is that uh, a lot of fishermen were uh, plunged into difficulty. Uh, fishermen that were out at sea um, had difficulty if they were you know, due back on land and so on. Sometimes they couldn't get to where they were meant to be. Sometimes they were, they were stranded. Um, fishermen were under a lot more pressure on, in two ways. One <coughs> is that uh, a lot of fishermen no longer had a market for their fish. Uh, because uh, restaurants and things had closed, a lot of transport uh, had uh, diminished in, in lots of areas. And so it was very difficult for fishermen to actually get out and, and sell their catch. Um, and at the same time, uh, in other areas, fishermen were under more pressure uh, because people were facing shortages and difficulties because food couldn't get to them. So if fish were available nearby, near them, near the sea, um, then uh, the fishermen were under more pressure to go out and fish. So it's this kind of, it's quite a complex pic picture of different kinds of, of pressures uh, on the sea. And the problem is that what we know is that the sea, uh, the oceans are already under so much pressure that these additional pressures um, are just breaking um, the, our, our, our ecosystems. They're, um, they're breaking the, the fishing industry in, in, in lots of ways, um, and our long-term prospects um, have really not been helped at all uh, by this pandemic. And what we need to do is, as we look to recover from the pandemic, we need to include healthy oceans as a part of our vision for the future. That's what's key here. 
Manuel, would you would you agree with what Fiona's just said? And is it is it too soon to even know exactly the the long term effects of COVID? We are still in the midst of a pandemic. I actually think that um, on the one hand, um, I would like to say that I, I do not have um, um, this catastrophic view of the oceans instead of the oceans as perhaps uh, others others have, and I, and I'd like to explain why because I think that part of the issue of the oceans is that this is extremely large. Uh, extreme complex, lots of these different processes in it. And it's very easy to just jump from black to white to simple answers to problems that are extremely complicated. And, and the pandemic is one example. So for example, in the fishing industry, there have been sectors that have been very badly affected by the pandemic, particularly fresh food, the fresh fish sector, because of the closure of restaurants and hotels, and there was just simply no way transporting the fish in, in time to eat, for it to remain fresh. However, the, 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 the tin and, and processed fish saw an increase in sales. Whatever was frozen and processed for that, then they saw a boom. So even the sector saw these increases and decreases in, in, in successes and failures. I think that it's important to realize thing, or two things, if I may. First is that when it comes to climate change, the estimations that we have from science is that for every degree of warming of the ocean, we lose about 5% of the animal biomass across the, across the ocean. Okay, that's 5% of the biomass for every degree. That means by 2050, if we stick to about two degrees, uh, we, we expect a 10% uh, drop in, in animal biomass. That has impacts throughout. And that's simply because the ocean, although remains productive, is less productive than it is now. That's one thing to consider. And the other thing to consider is that we have uh, FAO estimates every every two years, and we present that to the uh, FAO Committee of Fisheries that uh, meets every two years here in Rome. We present results of what is the estimation of sustainability of fish stocks around the world. And the estimate at current, uh, currently is that one in three fish stocks is overfished. Okay, that means that two in three are not, but one in three is overfished. And this changes very dramatically uh, between year and years in different regions, but overall it seems to be quite constant. We need to make sure that what that third of fish stocks that are overfished are not overfished in the future, because uh, an overfished fish stock is much more vulnerable to the impacts of climate change than one that is uh, more more uh, robust and is is got a, a healthy biomass solution. Thank you. Now, in fact, uh, Celine, you were among the first people to put your hand up when I asked whether you agreed with whether perhaps oceans are not always the number one priority when we talk about climate change. And part of your documentaries is aimed at really directing attention back at oceans. And in particular, you focused a lot on illegal fishing or overfishing. And um, can you explain kind of how the two interact? Because both of them are man-made, human-made, man-made, climate change, man-made overfishing. Together, the two are catastrophic. Have you seen the impacts of that? I sat on the World Economic Forum um, Council on Oceans for two terms, four years, and, and one of the main themes that we worked on is traceability. And this touches on what, what everybody here on this panel is saying from the source all the way to the use of any kind of um, natural resource. So whether it's seaweed or fish, um, the traceability is really one of the big issues that I think we need to take a look at. Because as Manuel is saying, perhaps at one in three uh, fish stock is depleted or depleting at an unsustainable rate. If we know that, we know it because we have data, we have information. So if we can really be accountable in terms of traceability, then we can start looking at, okay, let's, let's take the pressure off of this one element um, and turn towards something else that is perhaps more sustainable. There's also sustainable aquaculture. That is a, a, one of the solutions, not always very simple, but that's something that is a solution, you know, moving away from just the challenges and into finding something positive in all of this. And then you go to the end part of it and somebody like Mark, who's going to want to source something that's sustainable, that he knows what he is sourcing is going to want to understand the whole traceability. So for example, if you have in the open oceans, you have areas that um, are ungoverned. In those ungoverned places, you have ghost ships, ships that are just left out to sea with essentially slave labor on board. Those humans are unsustainably and unreporting, um, underreported, unsustainable catch, bringing them onto the boat, filleting or not filleting in horrid conditions. Then you have another boat that comes on board, offloads that fish, and therefore brings it to shore under a different flag and a different boat name. 
as a consumer or as a, a buyer for somebody who wants to actually be able to do good in terms of fish products, you're already losing the whole information, the whole data chain from the point of extraction to the point of use. So if we can, if we can start solving that problem in more areas of our ocean ecosystems, then we can start implementing more barriers to unsustainable practices. And that's where the positive side is, is that we have technology now that enables us to implement solutions to be able to know what it is that we're bringing out of the oceans, use the scientists' data and information and research to inform what best practices are, and then inform and educate the consumers. And this is where forward-facing people such as Mark or myself um, or Fiona, journalists who are out in the world actually giving people information, that's our job. Our job is to deliver the information hopefully in an entertaining and maybe tasteful way um, where it's gonna be attractive to learn and not just a daunting. Cause I do think what we need to do is we need to inspire people. Um, guilt doesn't work for very long. We can't just pressure people with guilt. We have to inspire them with good stories. And, and hopefully that's a little bit of something that we can all do today. Flower, did you have anything to add to that? Obviously, we've got, like I mentioned, people kind of at the other end of the spectrum. Again, you're on the on the ground firsthand. Is overfishing and other things like that affecting you in your area? Are they affecting some of the, the farming that's going on in, in Tanzania? Overfishing is a, is a big problem, yes, in my country because of climate change. So you find that uh, farmers, are uh, uh, the fishermen, uh, go on fishing and fishing and they catch even the, the, the small ones and uh, because of the, the the climate change even the the nursery uh, grounds of the of the ocean of the fish they are affected so it means that uh, the even uh, fish reproduction is is lowered and so the stock is also uh, reduced and the, the because of the climate change the fishermen will continue fishing they'll fish the, the juvenile ones and then they uh, uh, the reproduction is reduced. So climate change affects a lot the, the, the stock and also the, the sizes of the fish. And also some farmers use illegal fishing because they, they, they cannot catch enough, which is also affecting the, the, the fishing industry. And Mark, just quickly, do you have, a, uh, Celine touched on traceability. Is it hard to, to trace where you're, you're sourcing your, your fish from? Uh, you know, we, we, there was an app I was using um, the, from the Monterey Bay Fishing Society that, that was sort of a wonderful tool for chefs and for consumers. Is, and it was really, you know, uh, shopping for dummies, really. It's like, oh, it's red, don't buy it. If it and and that, those type of tools really do help. I, I wanted to quickly touch on something Fiona was talking about, about, you know, the, the change COVID had on, on fishing, actually, where I was getting um, calls uh, from, let's say, oyster oyster farmers that were like, you know, chefs, you guys have a big presence on your inter on, on, inter um, on Instagram and social media. We used to sell oysters, for example, they said, you know, 90% of oyster sales were going to restaurants because nobody wants to shuck oysters at home. So I was doing spending a lot of time during, you know, the beginning of the pandemic is actually trying to do demos on my social media feed on how to shuck an oyster or how to steam them open or how to roast them because and trying to and pleading with people to buy them directly from the actual uh, the, the oyster play, the oyster farms because you know they were like well who's buying my oysters 90% of my oyster sales were always restaurants and now home people don't really buy oysters so i try to buy oysters personally but i also try to inspire people to buy oysters and if you don't want to shuck them because it's they're a little bit difficult you can steam them open there's always it's as um, um, you know we have we have to find creative ways to inspire people Touching back on that topic of whether kind of oceans that fall off the agenda sometimes in terms of climate change, you know, we know that COP25, we've covered these climate change talks over many years. I think we first met in Durban, perhaps, but it was supposed to be the blue COP and that kind of fell off, fell off when it was uh, shifted at the last minute to Madrid. Now, COP26, climate change in your backyard, more or less. Are oceans going to feature prominently in these talks or once again, will they be shifted to a, a nice to talk about, but not an essential? Well, I really hope that uh, that this year, COP26 in Glasgow, uh, will actually uh, have a strong element in it from uh, oceans. As you said, uh, last year was meant to be the blue COP, didn't quite work out that way, but a lot of the work that was done there can come forward and can bear fruit 
uh, at COP26. Uh, and in Glasgow, of course, they've got a, a strong shipbuilding tradition there. So, you know, uh, they're, they're used to this whole maritime thing and, um, and that whole theme will be able to be brought out there. The question is whether enough work has been done on what's needed uh, for the oceans. What can we do uh, at the international climate change talks to actually ensure that the oceans are protected in the same way as we try to protect the land. One of the main ways uh, in which we can do that is by ensuring that, that there is funding uh, for the research that needs to go on and for the kind of projects that are needed around the world to help local people to preserve their own oceans. And those projects can be things like uh, mangroves uh, in coastal areas around the world. Mangroves have been destroyed across huge swathes of the planet. They've been chopped on um, and that has left areas of coast exposed uh, to storms, sea level rises, floods and so on because the mangroves in the past acted like a natural barrier against these things. So regrowing mangroves is a really important way of protecting coastal areas around the world from the impacts of the climate crisis and it has a brilliant knock-on effect which is that regenerated mangrove swamps uh, act as nurseries for fish, uh, they improve uh, the local biodiversity and so as well as providing climate change protections um, they're also helping the local economy by improving uh, fish stocks and so on. So Really, there are potential projects like that all around the world um, that need to be brought forward and seen as part of the way in which we are tackling the impacts of climate change and they need to be funded as such as well. Well, you've made a natural transition to solutions, in fact, thank you very much for that, because I'd like to now move on to Manuel, who's going to touch on perhaps an add on to what Fiona just mentioned there in terms of innovative projects. FAO, of course, involved in many of those. Can you give us a taste of what other kinds of projects are happening around the world? Yes, of course. I mean, first of all, I think that Fiona points out uh, some of the easy wins in, in, in this fight. You know, the, the planting of mangroves and, and, and the looking after the seaweed, the blue carbon in the ocean, promoting that. These are very easy solutions. They are win-win uh, and they are not that expensive, actually. And, and so I think that those are easy ones. Perhaps more difficult ones that uh, we, we know less on uh, what is the right answer. So if I may, for example, in, when it comes to, to fish stocks, there's two particular changes that we will see as a result of climate change. The first one is a distributional change. You know, fish moving towards the poles in particular, uh, or across the, the, the oceans in some cases. Uh, and that changes completely the relationship between uh, that resource and those that live from that resource. And the second is productivity change. Some species decrease their productivity as a result of climate change, will increase the productivity. There's estimates of both. Of both. Uh, so what we need to look in terms of solution is, first, do we have the institutions in order to cope with the fact that some of the resources become transboundary? They change and they cross boundaries and they are shared when before they were just uh, one country's resource. Do we have the institutions? Do we have the managed systems that are flexible enough to adjust where a particular species is being negatively impacted and others are positively impacted? Um, how do we do that? And third, do we have the livelihood opportunities for those that depend on the resource and that maybe will not be able to depend on that particular source in the future? So on those three problems, we actually have a significant number of uh, projects in the Caribbean, in South America, in, in Asia, uh, in the Pacific, working countries first adjusting their legislation to make sure that it's sufficiently adaptable. Uh, second, look at what we can support them creating new institutions that deal with these transboundary stocks, and then working with fishing communities themselves to uh, uh, adjust their livelihood opportunities. For example, can they change the gear, the boats, uh, or even how they process the, the, the fish so they can adjust whatever changes uh, will take place. And I think that is one thing that is very important uh, to, to remember here, that when it comes to adaptation, we are adapting to what is possible, but not what it is probable, because we do not know what is probable. There's a significant amount of uncertainty what things will go up or down. We know generally the impacts, as I said, 5% decrease in biomass every, every degree, but we don't know how this is going to be translated into specific species and specific places. 
And so we need to have systems that are adaptable enough to that uncertainty rather than being fixed and rigid and therefore less able to adapt. And coming off the back of that, in fact, Flower, you can give us a concrete example of some of the seaweed farmers in Tanzania have already adapted. Could you explain to us a little bit about your work? The women are adapting to the to, to climate change by actually uh, uh, moving into the deeper waters because we give the training to the, to the farmers that the, the shallow water areas are uh, getting warmer and warmer every time. So the best way is, is to move into the deeper waters. So they, the farmers now are moving the, the, the farms into the deep waters. Then the deep waters uh, conditions are, are much better, temperatures are lower, so they can farm in, in the deep waters. So this is one, the, one of the ways of doing that. And also they use the, the little seaweed that they, they, they produce to, to make seaweed products value addition, which also makes them resilient in the civil industry because the, the economy is, is improved. Uh, it's, it's interesting because you talk about deep waters there, you were cutting out a little bit from what I understand, they've moved some of their farming further out, but fascinating in terms of adaptation, some of the women can't swim in there. So there's another adaptation, which is perhaps a different, not a farming one, but a, a physical skill that needs to be adapted there as well. Swimming is a big challenge because the, the, the women cannot swim and working the deep waters to them is a problem. So you are right that the, the women need to be trained on how to swim and then practice so as to overcome the fear of working in the deep waters. This, this way they can work in, in the deep waters. Otherwise it is a bit a bit difficult. So for the women to go there, they need to own boats. So there's the, the question of economics there that they have to to, to purchase the boats so that they can go into the, the deep waters and work there. Uh, otherwise, it is difficult. So these challenges, these uh, challenges need to be solved. For example, the women to, to be trained on how to swim and to acquire boats to go into the deeper waters. Uh, now, uh, in an earlier conversation with Manuel, he'd mentioned that something that really bothers him is that we often see the uh, the ocean as an aquarium. It's someone else who touched on it as well. Say, I think it's Celine who was saying that you know it's a place that we visit, that we you know that we we enjoy rather than that we protect all the time. Media, uh, Fiona, the media's role um, in in changing the way we perceive the ocean. What more can the media do? Well, you know, it, it's really difficult because we tend to see, as you say, that the ocean as an aquarium or sometimes as a supermarket um, and sometimes as a, as a dump. Um, and I think that what the media can do and has been doing more in, in recent years is to raise awareness of some of the issues we're facing. Look at plastic pollution. We've been pouring plastic into the ocean for decades uh, since plastics were invented, uh, you know, more than a century ago. Um, and that has been a, a largely unrecognized uh, problem until recent years. Um, but then uh, a couple of years ago, we, we, we started really uh, taking notice of this. We had some television programs uh, where people actually went out into the oceans, looked at what plastic was doing. Uh, we had various uh, charitable foundations who uh, went around the world uh, raising awareness and so on. And now this has risen to the top of the political agenda and now just this year uh, we even have new global regulations uh, that have just come in uh, around plastic waste uh, making it more difficult uh, to ship plastic waste from one country to another as a way of trying to protect the oceans so you can see there that that awareness uh, raised by the media uh, has borne fruit it has had a really positive result obviously we need to do a lot more um, and one of the things uh, that we can do um, is to get more young people involved. And again, we talked about COP26, uh, the UN Climate Summit, which is happening this year. And it's absolutely vital um, that people get involved uh, in that summit. Um, not everyone can physically make it to Glasgow, um, even in normal times, uh, and we're probably going to still be facing some restrictions uh, later in the year. So an awful lot of this is going to ha have to happen online um, and you know what the pandemic has shown us is that so much interaction can happen online these days um, you know here we are uh, people on different continents all joining together uh, for this event um, so you know we really can do a lot more to raise awareness bring people together online so that people can exchange ideas form a kind of fellowship uh, online um, where people can have a community 
all around the world um, to actually, you know, put this forward into action. And that's where it starts. I think, and this year with COP26 is a fantastic opportunity to get people involved. Celine, did you want to add anything off the back of that? Well, I'm, I'm, I mean, what I'm hearing from everybody is the, the idea of creating allyships and creating allies and understanding that um, all sectors of society need to get on board in order for a message to be understood and heard and for change to happen. What Fiona is saying, I think, is, is spot on. I mean, the plastic pollution issue is, is decades old, much more than that. But it's now with the media attention and with social media that the public is becoming aware of it. And now the public is demanding change. And I think that that's something that we can apply to a lot of different of the issues that we've been talking about in terms of the oceans. But it's also really important as somebody who is public facing quite a bit and not to necessarily dumb any information down, but to make it tangible, I think is very, very crucial. I'm asked all the time, okay, we hear about all of these big ocean issues and climate change, um, what can we do? And the individual really wants to know. So the more we can deliver the answer to what you can do, I think the better off we're gonna be in terms of a co collective understanding um, that it's at, what's at stake in the oceans is, is for all of us, not just for the people who are studying it. Um, we think about economy and Fiona, I'm sorry, Flower touched on this in terms of the ability to harvest um, uh, seaweed off the coast. If the waters are too warm, there's gonna be less of a crop. Well, that's gonna impact the local economy. Same thing with local fisheries. We have to find solutions, as Manuel was saying, for the small scale fishermen, not to say you cannot fish, but how can we support sustainable fishing and support the health and economy of your community while also supporting the health of the oceans? I'll, I'll just cite one example real quickly that for me is really inspiring. Um, it's in Cabo Pulmo in Mexico, small little fishing village completely off the grid, 100% um, dependent on the fisheries and, and they were to save gas not going very far out. Um, to the point of flour again, boats are expensive. Um, and fuel is expensive. So they were really fishing just around their village. What had happened is that the fish stock were completely decimated and they had nothing more to fish. So they were having to spend more money to go out further. They asked for support, they received support. I'll make it short. They received the support in order to be able to stop fishing um, in their area. And there was a marine reserve that was created called Cabo Pulmo. I was there several years ago. It was just 10 years, 10 years that it had been protected. And that ecosystem in 10 years of protection had returned to its baseline health. The fish were back and plentiful because the baseline health of that ecosystem was basically to look like an aquarium. So now what has happened is the fishing community has not only been able to recoup the fish stock, they fish outside the marine reserve because the fish don't know where the boundaries are and they sell that fish. They can fish inside the reserve what they need to feed their family in that day and because of people like myself who want to go to far off places and go diving in beautiful waters, they have an additional economy through the, the tourism industry. So we really need to look at the environmental, environmental solutions hand in hand with community and economic solutions because they exist. We keep hearing this idea of community as well and perhaps nothing brings people together like food, Mark, does it really? For you, do you think food is really the interface of what's happening in our oceans and for the everyday person that's far away from flour, far away from the farming, is that how you see your role of connecting really food with what's happening in our oceans? I, th I think we definitely connect. I mean, we we are sort of the yeah we're we're connecting the farm, the fish, the delivery guys, everything to the people that are actually consuming it and paying for it a lot of the times. But I want to also touch on a little bit of on the plastic situation, where I have I have always have a vision of the world uh, half full because I think you know think people are great and people do wonderful things. I think what the media has done around just I'm just going to take plastic straws at least here in America. It went from, and this was before COVID, uh, there, there was obviously, there was so much in the press about it where uh, most of my friends in the restaurant business were, okay, we're not doing it anymore. We're not giving straws out liberally. We're gonna ask people if they want them. So we're not wasting a straw, which that little change alone was huge. And of course I went the extra step. I started researching straws and everybody was complaining about the paper straws. They don't work with. I found a company in California that was making straws out of kelp. 
And I was like, well, these are the ones to buy. Of course, they were five times more expensive, but I was like, it doesn't matter. We need to help everybody every step of the way. So I made it a point of telling my waiters to have this conversation with every guest when they wanted a straw. Just want you to know, this is a straw made out of kelp and, and, it, and it wonderful dialogue. People want information. I mean, you guys are in, in the press who are getting information out. People want to be educated. You just have to sort of find the right moments and the right clicking moments where people can really gather that information. And, and one other thing I wanna, I wanna go back to flour is, is it, it sounds like obviously all this kelp uh, and seaweed you're growing over there. I, I, I'm, I'm really hoping I, I get some recipes of what actually is happening when that kelp comes out of that water and what kind of food you guys are making with that kelp. Because I find that to me, this is the interesting conversation. I mean, I love all the conversation, but obviously for me, it's all around food. Can you explain to us, Flower, a little bit what the, the most typical uses of kelp is at, uh, at your home? In Tanzania, we have already trained the women how to make uh, several uh, products from seaweed. You can make a uh, salad out of seaweed, whether fresh seaweed or dried seaweed. You can actually make juice out of seaweed. And the seaweed, when it is boiled, it gives you a gel that you can put in, a, in jam and uh, all kinds of, of products. You can also uh, make seaweed cake. Uh, you can make a, uh, seaweed also can be cooked as, as, a, as a vegetable. So you can cook the seaweed and eat it with, with your food. So yes, uh, for, for the chef, you can have a lot of recipes from, from Tanzania to, to, to make your, 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 your food. And uh, you can actually import seaweed from, from Tanzania and, and make all kinds of recipes. We have, uh, we have inspired uh, two five-star hotels uh, in Zanzibar who are making uh, food uh, in their hotels. They have recipes for school cake, they have recipes for juice, recipes for salad. So we ha we can make, you can make a lot of, of food from, from our red seaweed that we are cultivating. Coming to New York restaurants soon. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Can, I add that, can I add to that response? Because I, I've, I've had the pleasure of being at sea in the water with flour and with the seaweed farm in Zanzibar. And it is, it fills my heart with joy when I see, when I see people, um, you know, getting, developing their, their own livelihoods in that way. And we have a, in Zanzibar as flour, no, we have a seaweed, sorry, um, a nursery, a hatchery, an agriculture hatchery that uh, FAO um, provide support for, where, where we grow, among other things, sea cucumbers, tiny sea cucumbers that are given um, to, the, to the farmers in the area so that they combine the seaweed farming with sea cucumber farming. And, and this is a, a way of, uh, you know, showing adaptation to climate change and showing how to bring solutions to the, to the, to the community. And I, I want to say that because there's one issue, I, I've been to the, to the, the last uh, five or six uh, climate change conferences, and, and, and I hope to be in Glasgow this year. And uh, every time that I go there, my message has always been, don't forget the people. Uh, and don't forget the people because don't forget that we have 619 million people that are hungry in the world today. Uh, this number has been growing over the last four to five years. And unless we solve the problem of hunger and the problem of poverty around the world, it is extremely difficult to solve the problem of sustainability. Um, in, in FAO, we can see that in countries uh, where hunger and poverty is not an issue, uh, resources are becoming increasingly sustainable because management is being implemented, is effective, it's monitored, it is, it is controlled. In places where, where sustainability is not the priority, management is not happening, resources are deteriorating further, and therefore the problem of hunger and poverty gets exacerbated. We need to look at the world as a whole, not just the ocean, but also the land combined together. Think about people, think about people, not just in the developed world, but in the developing world where the priorities are very different and see whether we can find solutions work for all of us rather than just for part of us, because that's what the United Nations needs to do, find solutions for all. And we need creativity, we need innovation, we need technology, and we need also a little bit of imagination to find the things that will work in the future that are not working now. With that, I'd like to actually move towards our, our final questions. Yep. I'm going to start in a similar way to how I began by just addressing the, a similar question to all of you. And we have touched on it, but maybe we can just recap. For the people that are watching, what is 
the one thing that they could do um, with respect to the oceans. It might be, you know, stop using plastic straws. It doesn't need to, I mean, the everyday person can't go and go on expeditions to far corners of the earth, but or write a, you know, a journalistic piece that's going to be read by millions of people. But what can an everyday person do for the oceans? I'll give everyone a moment to think about it, but perhaps Manuel, you could go first. Oh, well, I'm almost going to point the finger to Mark on this because I, I think that when it comes to climate change, um, first of all, I think that people should eat fish, should eat more fish. It's extremely healthy. It is rich in micronutrients. It has a less uh, low environmental impact than many other animal uh, production industries. But I think when it comes to climate change, people need to eat what it's there, not what they would like it to be there, but what it's there. And that I'm pointing the, the finger to Mark because I think that chefs have a great responsibility. I used to live in the UK and used to get upset that every time in the fishmonger, people would buy cod and nothing else but cod. Now I live in Rome and in here it's completely the opposite. People go to the fishmonger every Friday and they see what the fish fishermen have brought and they, they buy what's there. Eating what's there is the best solution that we can provide to make sure that we adapt our, our culinary tasters and our, and our diets to what climate change is creating, find solutions rather than finding problems. I don't know, I wonder if you buy cod on a regular basis, but I won't put you on the spot there. In terms of what an individual can do, what would your advice be? Yes, well, my uh, advice would be to get involved uh, as much as you can. Um, and that can be uh, through uh, making your views known, for instance, to your politicians, your representatives at a local and a national level and so on. Uh, getting involved with organisations uh, that have an interest in this, in sustainability, uh, that can be in person, that can be happening online. Um, it's to make your voice heard. And it's also, as a, as a consumer, we, we all consume things. Um, and if you uh, choose wisely uh, what you consume, that can make a big difference. But don't just make those choices. Also tell the companies involved. If you're choosing not to buy something from a particular company, because you don't like the way that they use resources unsustainably or they cause pollution or whatever, and tell them that, uh, write to that company, make it known online on, in, in any online forum uh, or social media that you're part of. Don't just do it in silence. Because they are listening indeed. Celine, um, if you had one final word of advice to the people watching. Um, I, I want to echo what's already been said because I think it's very important. Um, you know, Mark referred to the Seafood Watch, the Monterey Bay Aquarium app. Um, I think that's important. No excuses. We, we have the information we need at our hands in order to do things sustainably. I would say education would be one that I would push is, is really to start demanding of your schools um, that environmental education and specifically turning to the oceans is, is key in our, in, in our children's future. And to not underestimate that those, those children will grow up with a full understanding because it was always within us. So I, I would turn to pushing to education um, towards our ocean ecosystems. And Flower, what would your advice be? I would tell everyone to work to, I tell everyone to, to make as much effort as possible to, to, to conserve the environment and, and to, 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 to stop climate change. Uh, you can do a small thing like uh, 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 avoiding things that will produce uh, uh, harmful gases. For example, if your neighbor is, is using a fertilizer that is uh, harmful to the environment, you can tell them to, make, to use organic fertilizer. We have a lot of, nowadays we have even seaweed fertilizer that can be used. So by using these fertilizers, it means that, that the environment is not affected because you are using something that is organic. And then this way, the, the, you, are, you are avoiding also the, the, the greenhouse gases. We, you do a small thing in your, in your home and it will have an impact in the community. You don't have to wait to be invited in meetings or conferences or, or whatever. You can just talk to your neighbor, you can talk to, to, to school children, you can talk to anyone who is, is around you, including your families. Just tell them to do small things in, the, in their areas that can have a larger impact to the community, to the countries and to the whole world. And everyone can be conscious of impacts of climate change. We're hearing this real theme of making your voice heard. Uh, Mark, just to end up, what would your advice be? 
I mean, I think Celine said it, education is one of the most important things. I think educating the public, but I think once you have the education, you also need to sort of practice what you preach. And uh, not only, you know, I, as Manuel said, you know, shopping local, making sure you're eating the local fish. And, and if you really want to have that other fish, we'll figure out how, to, you know, there's recipes out there. There's the internet, figure out how to cook different recipes and, and, and to bring other spices and influences to how, however you want to do it. But educating yourself, practice what you preach, but also, you know, educate your friends, educate people around you, your family. Uh, when it comes to, uh, you're going out to dinner, have a conversation about why plastic straws aren't good. I mean, it's not that difficult. It's a, it's a, it's a harmless sort of, you don't have to be preaching. You don't have to get on a soapbox and talk about it. But I think just, you know, tricking people into learning things with stories, I think is very important. I think uh, Celine mentioned a good one about that village where you want to go, oh, you want to go scuba diving and see beautiful fish, go to this place. And then the story comes behind. Why are those fish there? Those, and then you get these wonderful stories. People love stories. People love um, experiences. And, uh, and just keeping in mind all of the um, all of the knowledge that all of you have here on this panel uh, and bringing that into it is, is very important. I'd like to thank everyone for taking part and thanks to the FAO, of course, for bringing us together for this conversation. I urge everyone to continue the conversation, for example, by following the work, uh, Fiona's work at The Guardian. Celine has a book, uh, Le Monde Après Mon Grand-Père, the the World After My Grandfather in English, but is available from all booksellers. Her film Tribes on the Edge is also available from February the 2nd. Flower's innovative work to farm the ocean in new ways is also uh, detailed in several videos available on YouTube. Mark has his own pro podcast, Food360, and Manuel's work with FAO can be further explored at www.fao.org. For now, though, find out more about us and the issues discussed at the address that you can see on the screen there. I hope our discussion today will help us all become better guardians of our oceans and, of course, the treasures that lay inside. Thanks for being with us.